enjoying it and it's, it's been good uh, and edifying to you. We want to finish the morning time of study with uh, a second message from Brother Shepherd. Um, the topic that I've given Brother Shepherd to talk about is the issue of meditation and mindfulness, what sayeth the Scripture. The world has a lot to say about the issue of meditation and mindfulness, and uh, he's going to cover what the Scripture has to say about that, and uh, hopefully how it impacts the issue of the renewing of the mind. So, Brother Shepherd, we appreciate your ministry, and uh, we're ready to go whenever you are. You can take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 11. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Russell Shepard. If you've never met me now in the back, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? <laughs> Yesterday, people in the back couldn't hear me. And that was disappointing. So my wife's in the back and Brian's in the back, Pastor Ross. And they're going to wave if you can't hear me. So please, back there, if you can't hear me, I don't know because I can hear me. All that, and it's like okay, I'm getting out there, but my voice is deep as I said yesterday. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. I've said that already. Um, let's pray, Father. Thank you. We give you honor and glory in our Savior's name. We give thanks and do pray, amen. Um, let me say this to you guys, and I, I didn't say it yesterday, but there's any, if there's anybody in here who doesn't know for sure that you know for sure that you know for sure for sure that you're saved or you're justified. Today, you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior as a free gift. And sometimes in these conferences, you don't think about the fact that there can be people here who've never heard the message of grace or are lost. So I failed to do that yesterday, and I regretted it, so I wanted to do that today. I, uh, it's a good thing to go last when you preach, because you sit there and write a lot of notes about what the preachers have said before you versus going first because uh, you're not really sure of the audience or where the message is going. But I appreciate the two brothers before us, and my message is specifically on, let me get my notes out here. Let me say this to you too. I have a, a Bible that I have no sin. Yeah? Okay, good. And, you know, as I've gotten out of age, I can't see anymore. I used to can see with the Bible a lot you guys have to have notes in it. So I have a big print Bible that doesn't have my notes in it. So with a big print Bible, it's harder to handle to get my notes out of there. And I was teaching, where was I at? I think it was yeah, our Tuesday night Bible class, and I put my notes in here, and my notes dropped, and then I didn't know what notes I had. So I'm like, okay, what do I do now? So anyway, Genesis chapter 11. My subject is um, on mindfulness. And what I was asked to do is discuss the differences between meditation and Eastern religions and scriptures. So it's meditation, meditate, mind the things of the spirit and mind it. And, and what it fits in is what, what the Bible calls to be spiritually minded is life, would be carnally minded is death. So I want to talk about that, but the origin of all satanic activity, not only starting in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam, but here in our passage, I want you to see some things because one of the things I was asked to do was talk about Eastern religions. And when I first read it, when I got the topics, um, I didn't put it in the context of the other messages I heard. So let's start here, verse number one. It, excuse me, it says, The whole earth was full of one speech, one language, and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Now you all know where you're at. In the Tower of Babel that goes back to Genesis chapter 10, and Nimrod, uh, who started a city, and he built a tower. Now this is that one world religious system. If you don't know that, it's a city and a state. You know any place today in the world that has a religious system that they have a city in the state? Yeah, you do, don't you? Do you know that? Yeah, we're among friends, right? It's, it's the Roman Catholic Church, where the Pope, the Vicar of Rome, has the political part, the city, but he's also their spiritual entity. This is it right here. This is the origin of it. Now, as I go through the lesson, and I might as well say this before I get started, this system is still here today. When we talked about the greatest counterfeit of what God is doing is the adversary. And folks, a lot of times when we talked about what uh, Brother Dez and Brother Ryan talked about, behind all these things, we have an adversary who can't defeat what God has done at Christ, through Christ's work at Calvary. It's complete, it's perfect. But he can trick us. 
And when I get in my lesson, I want you to think about people that you know, maybe yourself, who, through this world system, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the Bible says they're not of the Father, they're of the world. So the way Satan works is through this system out here, through the outer man, that all of us are exposed to all the time. And it has a tendency to conform us to its belief systems. Even when we're not aware of it, it's, it's seducing. Paul called it seducing spirits. And he called it doctrines of devils. You know, Satan has doctrines. And part of the way he does it is through a counterfeit religious system where his ministers are called ministers of righteousness. See, you couldn't fool us with coming and say you have to be saved by works. But as I said, I'm justified by faith, but I might try to work to keep my salvation, work to prove my salvation, or work to keep myself saved. That's hap that happened in Galatians saints. And I really appreciated what Brian said, because as a, as a young believer, and what Dad said too, when this is an intellectual thing, and I'm kind of getting off track, but I got a point to make with this. This is a good rabbit hole to go down. Uh, as a young believer, I had a lot of knowledge, but it wasn't according. I had a lot of knowledge, but it wasn't wisdom behind it. And the way in my life that the satanic policy of evil worked is when it came to trauma in my life. Instead of depending on God's grace and su the sufficiency of what Christ did at Calvary, I went back to Russell. You all understand that? And you know what happened when I went back to Russell? What happens when you go back to you? I messed it up. I forgot all about grace, and I went down this dark hole because it wasn't the spirit doing it, it was the flesh. All the grace information didn't work because it wasn't operable in a time of need. And so when you're going through health issues, financial issues, family issues, whatever it is, the, Paul says that the tribulation work is what? Yeah, it might take a little time to work, though. So in a time of need and desperation, the Lord worked in my life and restored my thinking. Okay, but here's part of what I want to get to. Verse number two. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Now remember that too as we go through our lesson. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now these are the nations. And they said one to another, go to and let us make bricks and, and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, they said, no sis, they said, go to let us build a city in the tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name. Notice they ought to make a name lest we be scattered abroad, abroad, abroad upon the whole earth. And then verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city in the tower which the children of men had built it. Now this starts back with Cain because Cain starts the building of civilization and cities. And so all around that spirit that's associated with these cities are still here in the world today. And behind all this is the adversary, folks. It's not God, it's the adversary. The point I want to make when I get to these Eastern religions is in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Boy, what a mess that is. And they have all one language. What a mess that is. And they begin to do, and what they're doing is they, they're doing what Romans chapter 1 says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination, as Brother De uh, Ryan said, and their foolish heart was darkened. Well, the adversaries doing that, and professed themselves to be wise, they became fools. And when they did that, the light was gone. So here's what happened, verse number 6, I'm going down after the colon. And now nothing will be restrained from them. This is God the Father talking, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, which they have imagined to do. Matter of fact, the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they might not understand one another's speech. So he goes down, and he confounds the, the language. It's verse 9. Therefore, the name of this is called Babel, because the Lord there did confound the languages of the earth, and thence did the Lord scatter them above the face of all the earth. Now come over to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. This is the 70th uh, week. This is the wrath of God, the day of the Lord's wrath, and the great tribulation period has started. Now that's in the beginning of the Bible, what we read in Genesis chapter 11, and you all know these verses, but I got a point I want to make about these Eastern religions and the origin of them and, and how they affect believers today. Uh, 
one of the people, I'll mention her name now, Oprah Winfrey. She would be one who says she believes in Jesus Christ, but she's also a new age person. In other words, we talked about that yesterday, that the power of God is within you, and all this enlightenment that you get by becoming a God. You hear them say that? They're all on TV today, all over the place. And it says in Revelation chapter 17, now I want to make a point about this because it's going to get to my lesson. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Can you all hear me back there still? Okay, having a cup in her hands full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her forehead was written a name, was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great. Notice what she's called, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. All the religious system, folks, that's it. And yet, that's, the, that's the, the religion of the Antichrist during the time of the tribulations. But you'll see through the scriptures, the development of the satanic policy of evil is still going to be the, become the most high God. And in the book of the Revelations, that's when the man of sin appears. So when you get back in Genesis chapter 11, the renewing of your mind, I was asked to discuss the difference between meditation and Eastern religion. So bear with me as I read this. Because there were seven main uh, Eastern religions. You know some, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucian, and Jainism. Now it says, these several religions have their foundation in India, China, Japan. They're from the East, right? And the major element of all of them that they have philosophy and metaphysics. Philosophy and metaphysics. Now they don't have the word of God. They have the philosophies of men. And they have a spiritual belief system. One of them is called karma. You ever hear anybody talk about karma today? You know, you'll be talking to people and they'll say, yeah, I don't do this because my karma. You say, okay, now if you're, if you're scripturally oriented, you know that's some crazy stuff. Now we might say it this way, whatever you sow, that shall you also reap, right? Or they'll say, what goes around, what? Right? See, so you all believe that stuff. <laughs> but Brian just told you to be perfect and complete in Christ. But there's a reaping and sowing principle in the Bible. So that's the karma issue. And it's subtle today because, you know, it, it sounds good. Right? Now, one of the things that these Eastern religions, as you think about it, uh, Noah had three boys. Can you tell me their names? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, Ham was a black man. You all know that, don't you? Yeah, once he, was a, he went over to Africa. Where, where did Jacob go? Yeah, Europe. And then Shem was, the, he's the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something more authentic about Shem's sons than it is about Ham. Ham goes out and creates the nation of Islam. Jacob goes out and he creates seven day Adventists or Jehovah Witnesses. Do you hear me? But something about Shem's boys, Hinduism, Confucianism, these Eastern religions that have more authentic, they're more authentic, Islam, Judaism, than the nation of Islam. Y'all with me? Or Jehovah Witnesses. It's just something about when they get a hold of something that's spiritual, they, this, our groups mess it up. So from this Eastern religion, come over to Matthew chapter 2. I want you to see something. Now, Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. They believe in several gods. What does the Bible say about several gods? What's the first verse in the Bible? In the beginning, who? Several gods? No, God created the heavens and earth. Now, we know there's one God manifest in three distinct and separate persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the Father, I am what? Right, and so God the Son is a manifestation of the second person of God here, but he's equal with God the Father. He's equal with God the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Yeah, so the Lord's in the beginning. He's the creator of all things, Genesis chapter 1. That's him speaking. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. All things were created by him and for him. And he's the express person of the Godhead. He can tell Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, what did he say? Isn't that something? So, the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a man in human form. We understand for the purpose of redemption. 
But before his birth, I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 2. I think you all know this verse too. I hope you do. But when Herod, they, verse 1, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from where? These are Eastern religions. Now there was information about the coming of the Messiah. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 11, you have the issue of the zodiac. When they built that tower, they were studying the stars. Genesis chapter 1 said that the stars were for signs. So they understand the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we're going to get to it, we're going to see some of it, but the revelation of God in creation was through the heavens declare what? The glory of God. And the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth forth knowledge. There's not a place where their voice is not heard. So before a written revelation, that book there, there was a revelation of creation. And yet the satanic policy of evil in Genesis chapter 1, God gave up that revelation when he called out Moses and the children of Israel. And Moses would begin to write in a book called the Word of God. So these Eastern religions, they've been here from Genesis chapter 11. Did that make sense? Did that make a connection? They're not something that just popped up today. But when we see society, matter of fact, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You folks do know they're in the world today, right? They haven't gone anywhere. So when Paul warned the saints at Corinth who were in Greece and all the different philosophies, I'm not going to do it, I'll just quote it now, but when Paul went to Athens, it said he saw the whole city given over wholly over to idolatry. And when he went to Athens, they asked him about what new philosophy do you have? Or what new thing do you have to tell us? Because it says they went out to, but to seek some new thing. Believers still seem to be that way today because as we started with laying the foundation yesterday, they're not established. And the doctrinal order of edification in Paul's epistle, so then you can still be tossed to and fro and care about with every winter doctrine and a slight of men and their cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to do what? Yeah, now who's behind the deception? The adversary, that's right. He wants to entice us away from our standing in Christ. So he's going to do this through these other means. And so you get around people, you're not, your mind's not renewed. And you know what I liked about that, the renewing of your mind? Renewing has the idea of continuing. It's not renewed that you're there. It's the renewing of your mind. So I think Brother Ross talked about, and I just share with you, the time I got saved, I got justified in May of 1974. And yet my mind is still being renewed to function in who I am in Christ. To, to be more, to know, understand more my identity in my inner man, and no matter what's going out in my outer man, that's not the issue. I don't walk by what I see. I walk by faith in God's word. And you know how I do that, folks? Just for today. Fear teams has a, has a way of affecting you when you're living in the future. For something that hasn't happened and you make it in your mind, you imagine things that come to pass that they haven't. Or you go back and you live in the past where that's not even a reality today. But the Lord is the God of the living. He's existing right now and so are we. So I have to be careful about this, the old nature, the old mind, not the new mind. But when Paul talked to the Corinthian saints, he warned them. And they, they had been established, but the sanctification part wasn't working. They, they weren't functioning in this new identity. And watch what he says, and I'm going to get to my point. Verse number 14. Be ye not unequally together, unequally yoked together with who? Have you ever met a believer who got involved in a relationship, maybe you're in this audience, with a lost person? You know what I know they don't believe? What that verse just said. You know how I know that? They would have ran from that lost person. I know a, a sister, I love her to death. She went out and she married a lost guy. And then you wonder why you have problems. Now, if you or me, it's challenging enough to be yoked together with a believer. Because <laughs> we, we have an opportunity to think the same way, right? But when Paul's talking about that, watch what he says, uh, yoke together unbelievers, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion have light with darkness? 
And what concord, by the way, when he says communion with light and darkness, he's talking about the satanic policy of evil that's the program of darkness. And he's talking about the program God has there, which is a program of light. We're children of the light. We're not children of darkness anymore. We were, but we're not now. So he's talking about these two programs, God's program and the adversary's program. Folks, you do know this is between God and the adversary, not us. Because we belong to Christ in his era, his ire, his, his fury is going to be aimed at who? The members of the body. Where's our head at? He's in the third heaven. So we're his representatives here. How does, how does Satan get to Christ today? Through us. He attacks the body. That's why when we get to this issue about the unity tomorrow, it's special now. We need to function together. I, I keep saying, folks, I'm looking at you guys. You don't know me from the man in the moon, but I'm in Christ. And if you're in Christ, guess who you are? You're my brother, brother, brother or sister. Do you know you're closer to me than my physical relatives if they're not saved? Do you believe that? Do you act that way? I don't know. <laughs> You know, sometimes we have resentments and, and, and are injured by other believers, and you can get hard-hearted and mad. Don't let me get off the preacher, man. I'll get back to this one. Okay, verse number, verse 15. What concord have Christ with Belial? We're going to deal with Belial in a minute. And what part have he that believeth with the unbeliever? And what agreement have the temple of God with who? Idols. For you are the temple of not the dead God, but of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they should be my people. Wherefore, what are you supposed to do? Here's the admonition. Come out from among them, and be ye what? That's the issue of separation, biblical separation for purity. And touch not the unclean thing. There it is, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you should be my sons and daughters. Here's the promise, saith the Lord God Almighty. That's the issue of that religious system still there. So I won't go through the rest of these because of time's sake, because I want to get into what I was asked to really discuss in my lesson. So come back to Joshua chapter 1. When God Almighty called out Abraham and he separated the nations from Abraham and then ultimately his seed, Moses, as I said, began to write in a book. And he knew that book was the word of God. Amen? I don't do too many amens, but amen. That's a good amen. No, he knew he, knew he was writing in a book, folks. God had told him to write these things and record them in a book. And when Moses dies, he gives this book to Joshua. Folks, the, the word of God wasn't nebulously out there. They knew that God Almighty had called out the nation and gave them his word so they would know his will. And so they were supposed to spend time in his word. The, the king was supposed, supposed to have a copy. The, the priest had a copy. The nation was supposed to spend time in God's word. You know why? Because they were children of Adam, too. They had a sin nature. But they had, in God, they, they were, the nation had been set apart to be holy. And it was a godly nation. So they had to get the renewing issue. And the only way you can do that, folks, is to spend time in God's word. We don't see that. Because I think one of the problems sometimes with us is we don't spend, we spend time in everything that really is not profitable. Godliness is profitable in all things. Having a promise, the Bible says, uh, this life and the life to come. It's, it's profitable. And the way I get the renewing of my mind is to get in God's word and see what he tells me to do. And as Brother Dad said, then do it. Now, if he says, husbands, love your wives, what am I supposed to do? Now, the issue of love there, folks, is a value system. I'm supposed to value and esteem what God does, right? What if she's not lovely? And she is, by the way. She's back there. I, already, I, I didn't get in trouble yesterday, so I don't want to start that today. But she is. But am I always lovely? No, she said, she tells the husbands to honor me, right? Otherwise, I honor the husbands. So that's the obedience of faith. And by the way, when we get those pastoral, uh, Paul's epistles that are written later on, his prison epistles, that's for the mature saint. So maybe that's sometimes why we're not able to do that, because the foundation's still not there. You guys follow me? In other words, you can't go from milk to meat. You got to start with milk. And the milk doctrines are found in Paul's early epistles about the cross. And then when you go to the meat doctrines, you have some maturity, some wisdom of how to walk now. When I say Judges, Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. Brian, I'm getting like you. Verse number 8. That book that was given to Moses 
And I got a purpose in this, folks. It's given to Joshua. And this is the issue of meditation in God's Word. What it has in my uh, notes, must say, of the Scriptures. Meditation and mindfulness. And now I want to go into the issue of meditation. Verse number 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Notice what? It shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate where? Then, how long? Day and night. How often? Day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do all that is written, in, written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have what? When? When he's in that book. Day and night. Come over to Psalms. Chapter 1. Now David understood some things as a godly man. David's called a man after God's own heart. And as we go through the Psalms, we'll see why. And I want to show you how the nation of Israel is redeemed by God out of Egypt and birthed as a nation, and God had a purpose for them to go in and take their inheritance. But the satanic policy of evil was designed to thwart them. And you know how Satan's first objective in stopping Israel from accomplishing God's will and word, uh, will was? To get rid of that book. You get rid of that book, you get rid of God's will for me. If you have the book and you don't rightly divide it, you get rid of God's will for me. We don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so he's going to use the counterfeit religious system, especially when you're not filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, when you don't know for yourself. Not because Brother Ross or Brother Daz, I get up here and teach you that you get in this book and you study to show yourself approved unto who? A workman that need not be ashamed. Write the divine word. What's there at the scriptures? Can you prove it? Can you go and point to the doctrine and the verses so you can function as a believer and, and walk in love the way God has intended for us and as full mature saints? Now, Psalms chapter 1. You all know this verse. Blessed, this is David saying in the first book of the Psalms, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of who? Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seat, sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is where? The law of the Lord. That's the word of God. And what does he do? In his law does he meditate how? What did Joshua do? Spend time in God's word, day and night. Do you do that? Now keep your hand there. I want you to come see a, a passage about the Lord in his pre-incarnate state. Come on over to Isaiah chapter 50. And what was said true of the Lord, the second Adam, this was how God Almighty dealt with Adam. Keep your hand in Psalms. I want you to see this. I want you to see the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mind of Christ became the mind of Paul. And the mind of Paul should be our mind. Verse number four. Now this is a prophetic scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ when he was born on this earth and what he did with his father. Verse number four, Isaiah chapter 50, verse four. Everybody there? Yeah. Verse number four, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. That's the Lord's ministry. Now watch what it says. He waketh me morning by morning. He waketh my ear as the ear, hear, the hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not what? Neither turn what? My back away. Now Israel did that, folks. Uh, the passage in Isaiah 55, the Lord said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Israel's a nation, we're going to see how they did it, turned away from them, and they went to other gods. But that wasn't the Lord's attitude. Verse number 6, you see, that's the cross. Verse number 7, he's asking for help. Goes back to Psalms chapter 22. But I want you to see when God Almighty woke the Lord Jesus Christ up, it was a teaching. And he wasn't rebellious against that. Have you ever woken up in the morning? And you sit there, and you can't go back to sleep. And you might start praying. You know what I do now? I know the Lord's saying, get up and read. It's quiet. Y'all never had that happen? 
We don't have the only one. And sometimes I say, Lord, I gotta go to work in the morning. And I get up, and I don't want to be rebellious. Because I know when the Word of God is in me and I'm thinking about the Word of God, I'm thinking like God. But if it's not in me, folks, I can't think on it. I can't meditate on it. You guys understand what I'm saying? So the Lord wasn't rebellious about that. Now come back to Psalms 1. Neither was David. Is this making sense? Okay. You sure? Okay. What time am I going to stop, brother? Okay. All right. And he shall be, in verse 3, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water of substance that bring forth fruit in the season. That's the one that's not like the ungodly, because David was the godly. His leaf in the nation of Israel, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he do shall prosper. And that's in the will of God. The ungodly, that's the lost man, Brother uh, Brian just talked about. That's the one that's dead, are not so. But they are like the shaft, which the wind drive, drive away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the kind. By the way, this is Gentiles here. Nor in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord know the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall do what? It's going to perish. Now, come over to Psalms 119. Now, David's attitude as a godly man was, is what's recorded. At least you have some of it in Psalms 119. The whole 119 of Psalms is all about the Word of God. It's also the Hebrew alphabet that's there from the beginning to the end. But verse nine, 119, verse 9. Psalms 119, 9. Now, watch what David said about God's Word, his infallible book. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed thereto according to the word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wonder from where. There's a tendency we can do that, to wonder. I'm always like when David said, Thy word have I hid in my, what? Heart, that I might not, what? So the heart is a mentality of the soul. You have a thinking capacity in your heart. And God wants you to think like he does. But the only way I can know how God thinks is to know his word. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they are what? Y'all don't know that verse? They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of who? Christ, right? So we can not only think like God, we can live like God, and we can labor together with him. That's God's will for us today as his ambassadors. That's why we're here. We, we're here to do his will with a purpose in this ministry of reconciliation we have. But now that we don't have God's word, and I'm trying to say, folks, sometimes cut off the TV. Let your house get quiet. Now, you guys probably do that. I'm assuming, should I assume they do? Okay. You guys, Brother Ross just said, don't do that. You can blame him, not me. Yeah. I think when your children are gone, there's an opportunity to do that. Because my wife, the house is quiet. You have in the morning, I don't come on the TV to see what the world's doing. Why? The world's going to do what they're doing. That stuff brings fear and confusion. It's the attack of the adversary. It's words without knowledge. Who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without knowledge? It's the adversary. How do you think he works? He told the Lord before the, 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 the cross, he said, you see all these kings in the world? They belong to me. This is his planet. He don't own it. The possession now belongs to the Lord. He has not disposed him because of the cross. But this system is the adversaries. So all this stuff is out here to have confusion and dissension. So you come on TV and the economy's failing. Right? Your pension's going to be gone. Correct? You're going to lose your house. Is that right? That's what they tell you? I guess you guys don't look at the news. that We're about to have another crash. David said... I, I've been old, I've been young, and I've been old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or see begging bread. You think he meditated on that? He saw the faithful of the Lord. He remembered the right hand of God, God's issue of power. So we're in Christ. And Paul said, he said something different. He said, Paul talked about the sufferings of Christ. You might be poor. You might suffer need you still have the riches of his grace and be able to do all things through Christ 
through Christ who strengthens me. Do you think that would work in you if you hadn't put it in you? So when the time of pressure of life comes, you can think on those things and you can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. But what are you meditating on? What's going into your mind on a daily basis? Is it God's word or is it the world's words? Or is it your words? Come over to Psalms 119, verse number 15. Talking about meditation. David, David said, I will meditate in thy precepts, that's his word, and respect and have respect unto his ways. I will, see the next word, delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget what? Thy word. Okay? Come over to Psalms uh, 119, 128. Notice David's attitude towards God's word. Verse 28, 128, Psalms 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning some things to be right. What does your Bible say? Yeah, all things. That's the things that God said to, to the nation of Israel, to, to David. And I hate every false way. Those Eastern religions are false ways, guys. Um, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. The believer today, because of the long suffering of God and the delay of God coming back and setting up his kingdom over there on that chart in the ages to come, you and I are going to suffer like people who are the lost. But does that mean God's not for you? Does Paul end up saying in Romans chapter 8, if God be for you, who can be against you? If God's against you, does it matter if anybody's for you? How do I know that God's for me? He that spared not his only son, the unsparing God, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he with him freely give us what? All things. So if I'm in Christ and I'm complete in him, I'm accepted, as Brother Ross said, then do I have to worry about anything? Do I worry about things? Do you worry about things? You can answer this one. <laughs> okay. There's a verse from Philippians says, don't be anxious about anything. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, I think for me, you, you learn through life. Now, maybe something's going to come I haven't experienced yet, but I have the proof in my life that God has been faithful. Always, folks. Not me. No matter what, he's been faithful. And I belong to him. It's the evidence that I can see his faithfulness. Uh, there never been a time that I've been out of need. Now, I don't think, I, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches like that. I mean, you might have not steak and potatoes, but you'll have your substance. He'll provide what you need. Come over to Judges. Now, I want you to see what happened to Israel, because this is where I'm about to take my lesson to. And I want you to see how it could happen to us, too. When Joshua died, the nation of Israel went back into the idolatrous system that God had brought them out of and the idolatrous system in Egypt. And it says in verse number 11, Judges 2, 11, and I want, to, I want you to see how that false, you know, Judges chapter 2, verse 11, what did I say, Genesis? Judge, okay. How that false religious system that was over there in Genesis chapter 11 infiltrated the nation of Israel, so much so that the nation was given over to satanic captivity by the fifth course of judgment when they went into the Gentile. When the times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar, that's when Israel became Satan's lawful possession again. And when the Lord came, he came to set the captives free. He came to not only redeem them, but to ransom them out of the hands of the enemy. And he had to bind the strong man. But he can only do that by doing God's will. And he was a perfect man. We'll see that in a few minutes, so let me move on. Judges chapter 2, verse 11. And the children of Israel did what? Evil. Who did that? Not the Gentiles. In the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. They went back there. And they forsook the Lord, God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods. 
the gods of the people that were around about them, and they bound themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord. Now here it is, and they served Balaam, or Baal and Astra. Baal is that religious system, that counterfeit religious system. Now Astra, what's Halloween coming up in a couple of weeks? Should I mess with any of this stuff? You know, there, there's Venus, Astra, there's Diana, there's Mary, the mother of God. See, she comes in different names, folks. That's Mystery Babylon. She's still here in a false religious system, right? Um, it's amazing to me that people who go and they pray in the name of Mary today, right? They're still here, correct? Now, I hope you don't do that. But I don't know. So, I want you to see something. Come with me over to Ezekiel chapter 8. This thing gets so bad. Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, remember what David was saying. And watch the nation. David, that's why David's the man after God's own heart. But the nation as a whole, they forsook the Lord. And this thing continues to get so bad that the religious leaders of Israel have became part of the satanic policy of evil. So much so that Israel's vain religious system, when the Lord gets here, all the religious leaders are part of the satanic possession. And so the Lord's calling out the nation, a remnant, the little flock, that's going to reign with him in that kingdom. Peter and the apostles and, and the twelve. And I want you to see something about the Lord's mind when we get through with this verse. But this is Ezekiel being taken into behind the curtains. Uh, verse number five, I mean Ezekiel chapter eight, verse five. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes, now towards uh, the way towards the north. So I lifted my eyes the way towards the north, and behold, the north, what northward at the gate of the altar was the image of jealousy. Now this is in the temple, right? Verse number six, he said, Furthermore to me, Son of man, now he sets up that temple for worship. See, if the, uh, see thou what they do, even the great abomination. This is Israel that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from what? My sanctuary. That was God's house. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see what? Great abominations. Now jump down to verse number 15, for time's sake. Then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty-five men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worship who? Who do they worship? They're not worshiping the Creator anymore. They're doing like those Gentiles. They worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. The nation of Israel has gone into idolatry. That's why God gives them over to the Gentiles as a type of discipline and chastisement. Now come over to Matthew chapter 4 and see the perfect man. And see what, this, what the, the anchor of the Lord's soul was when the adversary comes to tempt him and to disqualify him from not being able to be qualified to be Israel's kinsman redeemer by getting caught up in the same predicament that they had. Verse number one. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Those who leads him up, the Spirit, to be tempted of who? Verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he said, now watch the question. If thou be the Son of Man, command these bears to be made stone. I know you all know this verse, but verse 4, but he answered and said, I'm hungry. I need to eat. He's been up there for 40 days. Some of us can't go four hours to be tempted of the devil. He's hungry. And he could turn those stones into bread, but what does he say? But he answered and said, this is what I think about the matter. This is what the Eastern religions think about the matter. This is what the world says about it. This is what my political beliefs say about it. He answered and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? But by every word that proceeds out of whose mouth? Folks, that's the definition of inspiration. The words that proceed out of God's mouth. When God spoke, folks, it's his words in this book speaking to us. It's every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. 
He said, that's how man should live. And then it says the devil in Luke chapter 4, he left him for a season. Now, come over to Luke chapter 6. The Lord was steadfast in his father's will. And he's a perfect man. I understand that. So we're going to look at Paul, too. Because I don't know. Ten more than 15 minutes. But I want to make a point about the believers today and the seduction that Satan brings. When the issue of meditation came up, watch what the Lord is doing before he starts acting, acting on what his ministry was supposed to do. I, I've always loved this verse. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. And it came to pass in those days, everybody there? That he went up into a mountain. This is Jesus Christ to do what? To pray. And what else? Continue all night in prayer to who? Now, when he went up to pray, what do you think he was praying about? God's will. The word of God. Was he meditating day and night? Is that the example of it? And he goes up there first. Now, what does he do next? After he prays all night to the Father to execute his will. Look at the next verse. And then when it was day, he called on him his disciples. And he, the, of them he chose, what? Of whom he named the apostles. Now, before the Lord acted, he sought the Father's will. And he meditated on what God's word had said about Israel's program. Because Isaiah chapter 8, he knew that these men were going to be his children. I am the children whom the Lord has given me for signs and wonders in Israel. He knew God's will because he knew God's word because he wasn't rebellious against it. And just like David, he's the son of David. He thinks about these things day and night. He meditates on them. He's praying. And then he goes and does God's will. Y'all with me? So that's the issue how that works together, the word of God in prayer. Now, if I don't have the word of God in me, what do I know how to pray? What did Paul pray for us? I pray that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling, that you might know what is the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints, that you might experience the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Why do you think Paul prayed that? That's what the Lord told him to pray. That's what the Lord wanted us to know. So Paul's thinking about that. In Romans chapter 1, he talked about praying for them, that they might be established. He's praying for a perfect man. He's praying for us to grow to maturity. So we not only know the will of God, but we go out and do it. Now, come over to Colossians chapter 2. I want you to see something. Because, folks, the satanic policy of evil against the Corinthian saints, the Galatian saints, was different than it was about from mature saints. And I think a lot of you all in this category uh, about how the satanic policy of evil will come against us today. And it's going to come through a system of either thinking that you're Israel or by what Paul talks about beguiling us. Satan wants to beguile you. He said that about Peter too, right? And, and let me make a point about that too. What did Peter tell the Lord about standing with him before the cross? He said, Lord, I'll never forsake you. What did he do? You know what you and I would have done? Same thing. You know that? So if without the power of God working through the word of God and the Holy Spirit, I'm in trouble. I think you've been saying about the renewed mind, I need to be dependent totally on God. Because when I'm dependent on anything else, and that's going to be me, it's a mess. But if I don't have God's word to spend time with him, and through his word, and through prayer, and through meditation, I'm thinking about the things of God. Brother Ross said earlier, so I probably won't go there, but Paul talks about, about thinking on some things, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are just if pure, if it be a good report. He says, think on these things. What are you thinking about? Now, I'll say this to you too. I didn't get to it. When Lot was with Abraham and they split up, Lot had set his tent towards Sodom. You know, he saw the glitter and the gold of the city. And then Lot's in the city. And then it says in Second Peter, a type of the nation of Israel, the remnant during the tribulation period, it says his righteous soul was vexed day by day by the things that he saw and the things he heard. I have to be careful what my eyes see. I'm of Job's opinion. I made a covenant of my eyes. I wouldn't look upon a maiden. Folks, you can't halfway look at commercials today that the women aren't half nude. I mean, you're just looking at a, a game. Next thing a commercial comes on, and it can be a deodorant commercial, right? What is my eyes looking at? Now, I'll, I'll just flip it down. I can't handle that. <laughs> because I still have the old nature that can start lusting. 
for evil things. Y'all don't, y'all not that way, are you? I don't know what the women do, but maybe it's clothes when the, the, the network that sells the clothes and all that. Maybe you're going past that one, you have to stop there. That seems like more your forte. But the men are watching sports. It's interesting how they always have alcohol, don't they? Especially for you young people. Flee that stuff. Don't let them seduce you and give you something that's a promise. But when you see the misery over there, somebody was talking about, I think Dad's about addiction. They'll promise you. You see all the, the kids are having fun. Oh, they're just out there at the beach and it's a sunny day and they bring the beer on the table and they put the lemon or the lime in it. Oh, man, it's one. They don't show you that person throwing up in the toilet that night. They don't show you that person not being able to stop drinking. That's the lie. But at, now, Timothy from a child, thou hast known the, not scriptures, but the holy scriptures. Timothy had the pure word of God. And listen to me, folks. You have children and grandchildren, start teaching them from birth. Don't wait for the education system to teach your kids. They're going to corrupt them. Now you're dealing with viewpoints that are not a God. Y'all hear me? I'm a teacher too, with Brother Ross. They do correct your spelling. They do correct, correct your pronunciation. And you know, it's like, okay, look, I know it's spelled wrong, so. But I know what they teach in the schools. I was teaching fifth grade social studies. If you know anything, if you're from Michigan, National Heritage Academy schools. And they had in their social studies books that the, there were people over in South America who were undergrounds and some spirits came and told them to come up from the, the caves they were in. That's what they told them in the book. I'm like, what kind of mess is this? I didn't teach that. And part of my, my contract said if I didn't teach that, I could get fired. So what? I'm going to teach the truth instead of a lie. I wasn't going to corrupt them kids. I said, this is a lie. In the beginning, God created male and female. That's what the book says, right? See how we've gotten away from that? But anyway, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul says, now, let me, let me get over here and say this to you. When you get to Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians, the Philippians saints understood Paul's sufferings for Christ. The Corinthian saints didn't want to suffer. They didn't understand that that was part of the Father's will. Do you? I'm talking about not suffering for foolishness or stupidity. You have three sufferings. The sufferings of this present time, we can't avoid that. The sufferings of Christ, that's something you have to choose to want to do. The suffering for stupidity is what a lot of us do. Our suffering comes from the stupid decisions we make. And so the Colossian saints had a different level of maturity and understanding about following Paul as he followed Christ. But there's also conflict, verse number one. I would that you knew what, I'm almost through, folks, what great conflict I have for you and for as many, for them in Laodicea, and as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, until all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, God's eternal purpose, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's where it's at, folks. It's in him. You want wisdom, it's in Christ. You want all the riches of God's wealth, it's in him. Get to know him. Don't worry about everything. Out. This stuff out here is just, is just dumb. Get to know our Savior. And then he says, verse number four, and this I say, least any man should beguile you how? When enticing words. See how the enticement's coming? It was some, it's some words still out there. There are words in the form of spirit, but they're not God's words. And watch what he says, verse number 6 and 7, he's talking about our position. Verse number 8, he says again, Beware lest any man spoil you, how? Through philosophy and vain deceit. You remember what I read about the Hinduism? Part of what the Eastern religions believe in is philosophy and metaphysics. Metaph metaphysical things, realities. So they come with philosophies, the philosophies of men, and the wisdom of what Paul talked about, Corinthians saints, the wisdom of this world, which is what? Foolishness with God. You know, the, the, the Corinthian saints went after the wisdom of men and the philosophies of the Greeks, Aristotles, and Plato's. All the stuff that, came, that were plagiarizers from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. But why, I'm sorry, from the Word of God. But watch what he says, verse number uh, 8. Beware lest any man swallow you through philosophies and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, Israel's program, and not after Christ. Go down to verse number 
16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink in respect of holy days, the new moons, Israel's program, or the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come. That's future. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you. Who's the beguiler in the Bible? Satan. Of your voluntary reward, of voluntary humility, and worshiping of who? Of angels. And truth in those things which you have not seen the med medical, physical world. Vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind and not holding the head. Now, that happens when you stop focusing and functioning in his mind. And he goes down through Israel's program, verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. But I want you to see that there's some people here that have been seduced and they're not holding the head and they went back to worshiping angelic beings. Little idols. We went where we are staying. This little icon. You ever seen little icons with angels, the little angels there? They're cute little things, aren't they? That's not from God. Those are idols, folks. You know that, don't you? You don't know that? Those aren't idols. Angels in the Bible are the angelic races, the ones that appear are always men. So the only angels that appear in the Bible is a, is a demon over in the book of Revelations that has wings. You know that, don't you? But see, those things are so cute. Little things they have around my house and that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm being seduced away from something. Now, I hope I got across what I was trying to say. That if we spend time with God in his word that's written to us through Paul, and we meditate on these things. Meditate means to take that, you know, they, they use this, I'm closing. I, I didn't grow up down south, but they tell me when the cows take in the grass, they have two stomachs. Tell me if I'm wrong on this. And they have to regurgitate it. It has to be meditated on. And when they do that, then it turns into milk. Is that correct? Because I'm kind of somewhere wrong. So when you're not taking the word of God, you have to think on these things. And I'm not talking about the intellectual thinking. As a man thinketh in his what? Heart. The heart is the mentality of the soul. It's where belief is, is manifested. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, you have to get in the word of God for yourself. As you're taught and established, you get in this book and you let this book get in. Let me say, let this book get in you. And let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. And as they do that, then you're meditating on it. So when the satanic policy of evil comes up, I'm not enticed away from something that the world offers. And by the way, they're going to offer you something that has a um, reward to it. When Paul talked about the pastors in Ephesus, he said that some of them supposed the gain was godliness. There's times as a preacher, you might have a handful of people sitting there, and you see all these big churches. He said, man, I wonder how that would be. No, no, no. Preach the word, Russell. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I have to have the word in me so I can think like God on situations and the details of my life. Amen? Father, we just thank you. We pray that the word of God can have free course, that I was able to be used by you to communicate information.